So I realized we had defined the problem incorrectly. There's no environment out there and we are here and we somehow have to watch the way we interact with it. We are the environment. And the leading science corroborates this ancient understanding that informs us that whatever we do to our surroundings, we do directly to ourselves. The environmental crisis is a human crisis. We are at the center of it, both causing the problems and as the victims of the consequences. Let's look at the world through different eyes. The very first thing every one of us needed when we were born was a breath of air. That first breath was to inflate our lungs and to announce to the world that we had arrived. And from that moment on to our very dying breath, we need air 15 to 40 times a minute. We don't even think about it. Let's consider this vital but ignored event a single breath. It's so easy. Two to four liters of air deep down into those mushy organs that we call our lungs. If you've ever touched a, a fresh lung, you know how squishy it is. That's because it's mainly made up of air. The air is in those lungs. In fact, the air is circulating throughout our bodies to reach every cell in our body. When we breathe out, we don't exhaust all of the air because then our lungs would collapse. The point is, we can't draw a line and say, air ends here and I begin there. There is no line. It's in us, it's stuck to us, and it's circulating throughout our body. We are air. And when I breathe out, the air that comes out of my nose quickly mixes here and goes straight up your nose. And if I am air and you are air, then I am you. And we're embedded in a matrix of air, not just with all other human beings in the world, but with the worms and the snakes and the spiders and the birds and the trees. We are air. There is no boundary between us. The American astronomer Harlow Shapley did this wonderful thought exercise. He said, what happens to one breath of air? How do you follow a breath of air? 98% of the air is oxygen and nitrogen. We need that air for the oxygen which fuels our metabolic fires. So a lot of the oxygen in a breath stays in our bodies. Some of the nitrogen reacts biochemically and also stays in our bodies. But 1% of the air is an element called argon. Argon is an inert gas, doesn't react with anything, breathe it in, goes into our bodies, breathe it out, comes right back out. So argon is a very nice marker or indicator of a breath of air. How many atoms of argon in a breath of air? Shapley calculates about 3 times 10 to the super 18. That's 3 followed by 18 zeros. Take it from me, that is a hell of a lot of argon. So if we follow a single breath that comes out of my nose, very quickly that one breath spreads by convection through this room, and every one of us is breathing gazillions of argon atoms from that one breath. But of course the door is open, that breath eventually diffuses across Vancouver, across Canada, around the world, and according to Shapley, one year later, wherever you are in the world, because air is a single matrix, Every breath you take will have about 15 argon atoms that came from that one original breath a year before. So on that basis, Shapley calculates that every breath you take has argon atoms that were once in the bodies of Joan of Arc and Jesus Christ. That every breath you take has argon atoms that were in the bodies of dinosaurs 65 million years ago. That every breath you take will suffuse terrestrial life forms as far as we can see into the future. So air is more than just the physical component of the, of the biosphere. Air is a sacred element. It gives life to all terrestrial organisms. It links life in a single matrix and joins the past, the present, and the future into a single flowing entity. Our great boast is intelligence. Now we're a clever animal, but what intelligent creature, knowing that air is sacred, would then proceed to deliberately dump our most toxic elements into it? We are air. Whatever we do to the air, we do directly to ourselves. 
And this is true of the other sacred elements. We need to understand that nature gave us birth and is our home and the source of our well-being. And when we die, we return to nature. We should know that there are forces impinging on our lives that we will never understand or control. We need to have sacred places where we go with reverence and respect, not looking for resources or opportunity. These then should be our bottom line, our most fundamental biological, social, and spiritual needs. And once we understand that those basic needs must be the very foundation of the way we live, that they must be protected for our very health and well-being, then we can begin to look ahead and imagine a new way of living in harmony and balance with those fundamental needs.